We're going live oh, everywhere in the end. All right, everybody. Live. Did it just live all the things. Yeah. This is the time my power goes out or something. Right. Yeah. That's usually how that works. All right, everybody. Uh, hello, welcome. If you're watching the recording right now, feel free to fast forward 27 minutes. So that's when the, the actual webcast will begin. We started telling people this now because so many people are going back and watching the original recordings. And so if you're watching it, hey, just to give you a little grounding of where we are, if you're actually watching live or if you're watching the recording, because like this started to like really mess with my head that if you are watching the recording, but someone said, hey, we're live. Like, is it live or is this live or is this the recording? And so it is currently 12.03 Eastern time on May 11th, if you need some grounding, uh, if it's live or not. All right, it is time for pre-show banter. We got Ralph. Right. Ralph, go ahead and raise your hand. Tell us who you are. Oh, oh Ryan, did you want to tell us that we're live? Oh, no, no. No. you've been working on that one for a while? <laughs> we're live. Oh. We're live. Do you have an introduction, like a like a Johnny Carson type introduction? How old am I? Right here. I thought you were going to have a, like a phrase. Well, I'm using my live stream voice, which my daughter finds incredibly <laughs> irritating. And so we'll just keep going with that. So Ralph, go ahead and introduce yourself for all the people. Oh, hi, I'm Ralph May. I am a tester here at Black Hills. Uh, I'm excited to be on this show and talking about ransomware today. And um, <laughs> we've talked a lot about ransomware actually on the news, right? So uh, this webcast will be kind of uh, fun to uh, dive a little deeper. We've tried to avoid talking about ransomware because it's come up so much, but recent events have escalated our conversation. So. Just can't get rid of it, man. Yep. So I think I can show this to the screen. This is John right now trying to update both of his systems, and they both want to do Windows <laughs> updates. <laughs> this is why we come in two hours early, although he had yeah. another. And, and now the power went up. Oh geez, this is Bill Gates. I swear, he is. He's on. He's got so much more free time now that you know, oh. divorce and everything. Wow. So he's after. He's after him. Too soon. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna send him the. This is fine emoji. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I told him you got this, and it's fine. All right, everybody. So we have 25 minutes to see if John Strand can update the Windows uh, system on his computers and get oh, the power back on to be able to do the slide. Boy. So we're taking bets now. It's yeah. Good. yeah. yeah. What's the over under on uh, make it in time? Uh, hmm. He Windows said he has two. Mind. He said he has two systems. I think two. that yeah. affects the, that affects the math a little bit here. <laughs> I think I5 or I7, how much RAM are we talking about? Yeah, I yeah. Think, are these newer systems or? I think one of them will be ready in the next nine minutes. That's my guess. Yeah. Nine minutes. Nine. What was the estimate? I'm going to double that, whatever Microsoft said. That's it was actually... said 12%. <laughs> they don't tell you a number. It's 12%. Oh, they didn't even give you numbers. Did they gave up on the timing. No, we don't remember. It was always, yeah. when it always said <laughs> one minute left and one minute stretched into like an hour. They switched over to percentage. I don't want to do the MacBook update. It's like, this is going to be one hour and it legit is one hour. I'm like, all right, well, it's good better. Do something else for an hour. It used to not be that way, but yeah, they've gotten better. It used to have to uh, call it the, the Mac minute, which is like 20 minutes when it says this will finish in one minute. Almost done. It took 20 minutes, but, but now oh, like it's actually yeah. accurate. It's like the I game remember, right now. It would be done sometime between eight and four. Yeah. I remember when I was younger and I got like literally my first computer. I had Windows 95 on it or something. So now I'm dating myself. And uh, the <laughs> I'm transferring a file or something and it's making that animation where it's just moving the little files, you know, one <laughs> over over. And uh, I was talking to a friend at the time on the phone. I'm like, how many times does it have to move that file before it's done? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like I was like, this must be the indicator. Like I need to count these or something, right? This was inaccurate. So, All right. With so uh, to continue with introductions, and also for there's hundreds of you here already. Uh, we are doing what's called we call preacher banter. Dozens of us. Dozens. It's where we show up 30 minutes early just to talk about whatever. Uh, if you are not in our Discord channel, we have the link. Inside go to webinar, you can join Discord. It's an invite. For like the first five minutes, you can't talk. That's a safety measure because there was this one time we didn't have that and, and I had to delete everything and I still can't forget what all the things I saw. And so 
<laughs> we have that there. Discord is where you can interact with your fellow attendees and John. John has this incredible ability to just like see Discord and respond to it as he's talking. Uh, but if not, we can always take your questions and respond. We also learned that since there's thousands of you and there's only like 12 of us, uh, we don't scale as well as the rest of you do. So if one of you has a question, generally the other people watching can help answer that question. So uh, we rely on the power of the community to help us do what we do. And then we have Dale here. Dale, who are you? I'm Dale. <clears throat> That's great, Dale. That, that uh, <laughs> I'm the resident Canadian. It, every you can time go by a shirt. Yeah, he is wearing a sorry shirt for everyone who can't see that. I wore it specifically for today. Sorry, you got hit with a ransomware. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, we got Kyle here. Who are you, Kyle? Uh, yep, I'm a uh, tester at Black Hills as well. Okay. And Fletch? Also a tester at Black Hills. It's like maybe we work here together or something. That, it's that's, weird. That's crazy. I'm, I'm thinking about working on a new title. I don't know. I mean, just making up something better, you know, than tester. It just seems so bland. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Uh, you... Artisan, security analyst, craftsman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something, something around those edges, right? It really describes me in no way, shape, or form, but just, you know, puts a bunch of flavor in there. If you include artisan and flavor. craftsman, you're going to have to roll up your paints and, you know, Put a beating on your head. Okay. <laughs> uh, you have some very strong emotional reaction to that. I, I see yeah. it. And BB, who are you? I'm BB. I'm a I'm a typist here at Black Hills Information Security. There you go. I push typist. buttons all day long. I have a collection of <laughs> buttons here in front of me, and I just spend all day pushing them. Well, I would say what I do here is I make reports. <laughs> yeah. right. right, right. That's what I do. Lots. Yeah. Lots of important. We string words together and put screenshots in and Yeah, for people who don't know, I would say fifty percent of this job is writing that report. Uh, like it, I know that seems that crazy was... to say that, but that is a real thing. <laughs> the other mm -hmm. the other fifty or forty nine point nine nine percent, that's Googling, right? Google. And then there's the <laughs> <laughs> <And> the command. <laughs> How do I get this thing to work? Yes, exactly. All right. And as a reminder to the whole community, if anyone in Discord ever says they have an issue not being able to see something, hear something, or something like that, just go ahead and tell them to refresh the browser. Now, if all 300 of you tell them that, uh, maybe we'll just, you know, the first 700, just let them know. Uh, but that's normally fixes any problem inside like good webinar. We also have this link to YouTube. If you don't want to use go to webinar today, you can always go and watch this live on YouTube. I think we have a couple hundred people watching on YouTube right now. 248. Yeah. So the issue that we're running into today is that our account, 21%. Uh, 21%. Here's my guess. He's not going to make it in the time period, but that's just my guess. I mean, I hope that it's not true. Uh, and he said, totally fine. Is, fine. is it installing or downloading? It's in, oh, that's a good point. Is it installing or downloading? So how far everyone along? here, uh, we put out the word that we're going to do this webcast today. John just gave a presentation at an event, and he was planning to arrive 11 minutes ago, and then he sent me a text saying his Windows system is updating, and then his backup system is updating. And he is currently at 21%. So we have 19 minutes for John to finish installing the updates on his computer, get it up and running. Also, the power went out at his house. And so we are just as excited as you may be <laughs> as to whether this webcast will happen. Maybe he got hit by ransomware and it's not even a real update. Yes. Wouldn't that be awesome? This that my case a great story. I heard you made backup slides just for this you were going to present. You have... Yeah, so yeah. we have the ability to play a version of whose slide is it anyway, where <laughs> I will start with slide one. I'll pass it off to Ryan for slide two. And Ryan, go ahead and introduce yourself. This is me, Ryan. I'm doing the Vulcan thing because it's there in Discord. And uh, I do... Uh... <laughs> yeah, it was. No, no, Vulcan. I just... No, 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 no. Anyway, I do uh, the video stuff or attempt to do the video stuff and, and kind of fall behind on it. But I do the video stuff. And uh, that's why I'm here. 
All right, we got Deb sitting next to me. Go ahead, Deb. Off oh. camera. Oh, she's on camera. <laughs> I just randomly will giggle through the whole thing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, and also, uh, John wanted to schedule this emergency webcast, and I was like, John, I don't know if I can make it. I have this COVID shot I need to get like 30 minutes into it. He's like, oh, that's fine. Just go ahead and leave. I was like, all right. I'll have it all under control. I'll have two computers. They'll both be online. We'll be ready yeah. to go. Just go log in from your phone. And uh, you can tell it, you can show us uh, what it's like in line for your shot. <laughs> It'll be great. We got to fill, we got time to fill anyway. We got time to fill. <laughs> we got you know to fill. Logging in with their phone is going to be John, just like, all right, guys, here's my slides. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so if anyone needs the slides, they're inside GoToWebinar. There should be like a little handouts button on the right-hand side. I haven't seen the interface in a while, so uh, I'm I don't oh, yeah. to see yeah, it's there. Interface. Uh, but the, you can download the slides right here in GoToWebinar, or you can grab them inside Discord in the Slides channel. All right, yeah, we got a couple hundred people here just really killing time for the next 16 minutes and we'll see if John shows up. Correct me if I'm not wrong here, but isn't the Windows update like not optional anymore? Like you can only like tell it no so many times, and then it's like no, no, no. We insist. Yeah, you you, <laughs> well, you, you can tell it like hours that you don't want it to do to do the installation. Yeah. But if then the computer's mm -hmm. not on during the open hours for a long enough time, it will say, you know what, I'm going to do this anyway because it's not your computer; it's my computer. Yeah, I've had enough of you. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The, the one thing you can do they, from Microsoft. They, well, they added that thing in where you can say um, delay updates for seven days. So, so like if you know ahead of time to go and do that, you can. That's like the only leeway they give you to have any control over your computer anymore is one week, like one week at a time. Yeah, I, I know with the enterprise version, you get like a lot more control. But you know, everyone else just on regular professional, you're actually not in control. It's for your safety. I guess while we're killing time, I was going to show everyone the free version of Backdoors and Breaches that's available online, where you can play Backdoors and Breaches, and you can flip all the cards. This is just me really stalling now for John to show up. <laughs> yeah, Kyle, don't you have like a training class coming up or something? I do. Yeah, um, I'm teaching a, a Windows post exploitation class coming up here. Um, I guess we could link that in the chat here. Oh, it's a minute. Wow, that was quick. Um, <laughs> oh, they're ready. Yeah, that was um, wow. Okay. Yes. So I'll be talking about um, basically everything you want to do once you get your initial code execution in an environment. So um, performing enumeration, persistence, uh, privilege escalation, and lateral movement. Uh, and so for each of those, we'll have a day for each one. Um, and we'll talk about some different popular tools and techniques. We'll go over what the OPSEC implement, uh, implications are. Um, I talked about what some different open source detection rules and things exist and how you might get around those. Um, and then we have lots of hands-on labs to try out some different tools and write our own implementations and um, just kind of get familiar with, with some of the techniques. And what would you say is Windows post-exploitation? Um, so basically everything that's going to happen after you get your initial execution or, or your macro or your malware or whatever it is running in an environment, it's basically all the steps you can take to accomplish whatever your goal is, whether it's getting um, some administrator access or accessing sensitive data or whatever, you know, uh, your goal is in, in the test or in the simulation. Um, that's kind of uh, what I cover is everything that happens after you get your initial, you know, a command line or, or malware in the environment. Kyle, what would, what would you say? say to you oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, uh, Kyle, what would you say is the first thing you want to do once you get that initial uh, access? So a lot of people want to jump to establishing persistence immediately, which, mm -hmm. which is important. Um, but I think before that, you should consider, like, performing some host enumeration. Um, so we talked about kind of performing some initial recon to get an idea of what um, security software exists on the endpoint, um, as well as just like what normal user behavior looks like, so that you can sort of pick a persistence and other methods um, based on, you know, what is already kind of going on in the environment, 
so that you kind of blend in with with the typical behavior. Awesome. Thanks, Hal. And how many times have you gotten a chance to teach this so far? I'm sorry? How many times have you gotten a chance to teach it so far? Uh, I have never taught this before. So this is going to be the first. Uh, the first run of it is the end of May. And then there's another one uh, in person at Wild West Hacking Fest way west. Yeah. Well, I've seen you, you give a hacking cast recently, and that was fantastic. Really well received. So. All right, so we have 12 minutes for John Strand to show up. I believe his computer, I don't know, I'm just guessing it's at 27% installed. Um, I'm sure that's it's gotta fine. be at 80, 80 by now, 82. 82. Yeah. I'm thinking 82. 82.3. Like yeah, I was, I was right about the nine minutes, so you know, I'm right about the 82 right now. Yeah, but you're right, you're right. You can see. All right. And what's happening right now is for everyone that's here, this is what we call pre-show banter. The webcast is supposed to start at 12.30. It's an emergency webcast on ransomware that John uh, contacted me Sunday morning. He's like, I really like to do this. Can we get everything up and running? And I was like, yeah, I think we can get the word out to everybody. And then about 19 minutes ago, his Windows systems decided to install updates, which means he did not show up as expected. So he has 11 minutes until the webcast begins. It's He's exciting, a, right? He's stuck in a Windows log jam. <laughs> uh, you've been waiting for that one. I like it. <laughs> uh, I, just uh, I, never, I never introduced myself. I'm Jason Blanchard. I'm the content community director here at Black Hills Information Security. I help facilitate the sharing of knowledge and uh, build and foster community. So that's what we have here at the Discord. If you are not a part of the Discord, I highly recommend you join it. We have 19,000 people that are part of the Discord channel, all sharing their knowledge and helping each other. If you have a question to ask, you can always ask it. If at this time, though, anyone posts anything I consider terrible, you will be banned for life because you are live on screen. So just be careful. Uh, so if you've never used Discord before, a couple of things to note is we have the slide channel where you can go ahead and grab. Uh, I also put the link here to get uh, backdoors and breaches for free from GitHub. Put the slides today for John. We are in the live chat channel. It's got the big red circle next to it, so that way you can find it quickly. And if you want to know about our upcoming schedule, you can check it out here. We do have webcast this Thursday, this Saturday. We have a six-hour training. Shelby, I don't know if you're available, but if you want to pop up, we have a six-hour workshop that's 100% free. And so you can just join. It's got a downloadable VM. It's got everything that you need to start getting a lot of content. Start content. Hey, Shelby, yeah. I'm going to show it right now and just share the link inside go to webinar. Awesome. Yeah, and we actually updated it recently, too. It used to be a, a four-hour course, and now it's been um, updated to six hours to give more time to work on the labs and everything. And um, like Jason said, it's going to be on Saturday, um, 11 p.m. or 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and we usually try to run the trainings about once every other month. So, yeah. And, and it's like a full class. This isn't like, oh, we're skimping or anything. There's no skimping. This is like a full VM. You get all the labs, the slides, the, you get access to the recording in case you want to go back. And you're like, well, why is this free? It's because we really want people to threat hunt their environment. Uh, and so we cover the open source tool. And can you tell them a little bit about Rita? Um, yep, yeah, Rita is our uh, free open source threat hunting tool. Um, so a lot of the labs, uh, the way Chris does them is you um, go through the labs on your own and then you go through them again using Rita and you see like what the power of that tool is and all the awesome things it can do for you. Um, so I think that's really cool as well. Yeah. And if you're like, well, what are we doing right now? We're, we're stalling a little bit because we, <laughs> we expected John here 22 minutes ago, and he's at 91%, everybody. <laughs> Very nearly the there. climbing. Yeah, he still has to go through the reboot on the... Uh, yeah, the I was about to say 20 bucks is a reboot immediately following. Oh, yeah. uh, this is so why I run Windows XP only. That's it. Because you never have to update. There's no more update. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Also, we have a team of people here that are going to help out. We got Ralph, we got Dale, we got Fletch, we got BB, we got Kyle, we got Ryan, we got Deb, we got Shelby, we got Velda, we got all kinds of people here that are going to help. And so if you have questions, you can always go ahead and ask them inside GoToWebinar, but I highly recommend you ask them inside Discord because you'll have an entire community of 18,000 to 19,000 people 
that are willing to respond. Now, if you're like, hey, Discord's really hard because there's like nonstop stuff flying all over the place, uh, that's okay. Like, I, I get it. Uh, you can always go over to YouTube, watch it live at YouTube. We do have a YouTube link if you don't like any of the stuff that we're doing here and you're like, YouTube makes me feel better. I'm like, cool. All right. And so you can always go over to YouTube. YouTube link. How do you spell YouTube? All right, there we go. You and a tube. YouTube. I also YouTube. pinned YouTube. the links up here. There so if tubes. you need any of the links that we've talked about recently, like Way West, which is coming up soon. It's our first in-person slash hybrid conference that's happening in June near Reno. Uh, we're going to be there. We were one of the first to go virtual. We will be one of the first to go back in person. Oops. And it will be socially distanced. It will take all the precautions that we can. Um, but we want to see people again because we miss them. Uh, Kyle's class is right here. That's a pinned. And if you're interested in Kyle's post-exploitation class, it's right there. And then the link to YouTube is there as well. If you didn't know that pins happened up here, yeah, pins. Yeah, they're right there. Uh, another channel you should check out is the recordings. If you want to see past webcast, uh, whenever we get done with a webcast, we'll go ahead and post it here along with the slides. So you can go ahead and get the slides along with it. If you're currently seeking job advice, you can always hit it up here. If you have imposter syndrome, you can commiserate with others here in this channel. If you're a college student, feel free to talk to other college students there. If you need help job hunting, we have a series of job hunting videos to help job hunt. That's something that I do on the side. If you want to talk about anything at all, feel free to do that in open chat. And then if you want to talk about tools, uh, there's a ton of tools. Like if you just scroll through here, there are just nothing but amazing and good tools that you could utilize in your day-to-day -day work. Uh, but if you ever post a tool, please give like a brief synopsis about it because uh, be weary of clicking on strange links on the internet. Just because it's in here doesn't mean it's legit. Uh, if we do find something that's not legit, we throw it in the sandbox and we play with it immediately. Um, but, uh, <laughs> We'll also delete it. Right. Uh, yeah, we're gonna have a yeah, we're gonna have a uh, bull riding competition, a mechanical bull riding competition. At I can't the, wait to see how good you do, Jason. It's gonna be amazing. <laughs> I've never ridden a bull. Yeah, I think it'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> I've totally never ridden a bull. So I started telling my daughter things like, "I totally didn't eat your food in the closet." And she's like, "Daddy, why'd you do that?" I was like, "No, listen to the words I'm saying." I totally did not eat the food in the closet. She's like, stop. I said, I, I'm totally being honest right now. <laughs> All right, so if everyone's wondering what we're doing, we have five minutes till the webcast begins. Uh, John's wife just said John will be there shortly. Uh, so now we've gotten to the point where I'm getting texts from both of them. <laughs> <laughs> and the suspense is out of band communication. <laughs> Oh, so in movies, if you don't know, they create this thing called a time lock, uh, where you have to defuse the bomb by a certain time that they have till the next moon in order to like stop the kill killer or whatever. And so they create this time lock. It creates a sense of urgency that James Bond has to do something by a certain time. And so we really have a time lock right now of four more minutes before <laughs> this webcast begins, and John Strand is not here. So. So, Jason, what do we do if we don't make it in time? We're not thinking that far. Don't worry. He'll be here. So, yeah, yeah. One moment at a time. This is what they mean. Yeah. It's, it's they mean. If you don't, don't make yeah. it, YouTube is going to blow up. Yeah. Jason, you don't have like a little playbook that's got, like, you know, you, like, flip to the page. It's like, all right, if John doesn't arrive, Go to page 16. Okay. No, no, I don't have that. No. No, that's weird. That's weird. Yeah. No, I get it. Yeah. All right. So if this is your first time on a Black Hills Information Security webcast, well, hello. Thanks for being here. Uh, they're not always like this, but they're kind of always like this. Like I actually I just lied. They're always like this. This is this is how they are. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> oh, there he is. John has appeared in Discord. Uh, yeah, he did. Yeah, the old John Strand. I wonder if that guy actually gently, like, actually drew John Strand on him just because of the amount of times he was confused with John Strand, the InfoSec guy. Uh, 
I want to know who gives more like popularity to the other. Is it the John Strand from InfoSec creating the John Strand model more popularity or the opposite, right? Like um, who's, who's number one on the Google search? <laughs> yeah, like would John Strand the model ever bring up John Strand the InfoSec? But it seems yeah, it's always yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was all fun and games until he breached the Capitol and then <laughs> Yeah, well then he got a lot more popularity than I think he had before. Yeah. And now I'm getting Google alerts that John Strand breached the Capitol. I'm like, hey, John, I know it's not you, but uh, you should probably look just, into this. Just a fun fact for those who didn't do this, Google has John Strand number one, not the model. So just the name John Strand, he is number one. Now, if you put the model, Google's like, I know who you mean. <laughs> but there is photos of John Strand number one, uh, not the model, and then immediately following many model photos, and it's just wondering if John Strand was a model at one point. <laughs> uh, so he has now moved on to security and update issues. Uh, oh, yep. I think that's the same thing as before, but uh... <clears throat> oh, wait, he's here. I see. I see wait, somebody. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Did he join? Oh, oh my gosh, he's frozen, but he's here. Right before the bomb detonates. Oh. oh my god. <laughs> John, I. Oh God, John. Are we ready? Are we ready to webcast, people? Oh my God, what a train wreck! <laughs> well, you're still frozen. Yeah, John, you're, you're still frozen. frozen, but we can hear you. Yeah. It's oh my God, let me kill my camera. Um, I probably should go in and set my right camera settings. So yeah, so I usually um in my I'm on my linux partition and i jumped over to my windows partition and it's like oh, no. yeah so we need to install some updates now and um okay so we should have the right camera we got that i need to install some updates right now and uh so i have a backup computer uh actually erica has the backup computer and um I powered that one up and i shot a message to jason i don't know if he shared it with everybody but yeah yeah, yeah so the backup computer's like, I'm going to install updates too, because why <laughs> the hell not, right? Um, so I only see that we have 13 attendees. Is that because we're streaming to the YouTubes? Uh, that's staff, John. Uh, the other one, yeah. the other column is 29, uh, 2300. It's, 2300. it's climbing fast. Yeah, there we All go. Right, so that's it. Go let's, ahead let's do this. We have, uh, we have so 500 on YouTube. All right. Let's do this. Oh, I remember which, now I'll get us kicked off. My camera's on. John, just take, John, just go ahead and take that deep cleansing breath that we talked about. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. And you're uh, like you're sending me in your screen. Like, so please. You're like sending me screen. Screen. You're sending me memes like, dude, you got this, you got this, while like everything's on fire. So, all right. Oh, are we sharing so, screens? Can we confirm? There we go. I should see my screen. So, so everything that happened. So, I usually am in Pop OS, and go to webinar doesn't work with Linux. So, I had to switch over to my Windows partition, and then it started doing a series of updates. And then um, I'm like, crap, this is taking a while. So then I grab my spare computer, open it up, it starts doing updates, and um, trying to get logged into absolutely everything and then um, the power went out here in uh in samara and costa rica so thankfully i've got my ups and everything so that's great if i was using my ups unfortunately um my router was not plugged into the ups at that point it was plugged into a different plug so it's just been absolutely insane i want to thank everybody for coming here i think this is uh close to a record for the number of people that we've ever had at a webcast and jason just once again to confirm we are good like we got video We've got slides. We're in the pipe, five by five, right? We do. We're about to hit the 3,000 max, John. And so what we're going to have to do now is start routing people over to YouTube Live. So if anybody feels free, if you want to just leave this go to webinar experience, I'm going to drop the link inside go to webinar here. If you want to copy that and paste it and go to YouTube Live and watch it All there. Right. So we are just uh, 100 shy of hitting the max. So welcome to this Black Hills Information Security webcast. Thanks for being here today. If you ever need a pen test, what you know, Red Hunt, any of those. We do that and stuff. We do that. And I'm out. It's all you, John. All right. Let's go. All right. So the name of this webcast is I Hate Ransomware, and you should hate it too. 
Um, now, there's a number of reasons why I hate ransomware. We're gonna get into a large number of those reasons in this webcast, uh, but probably the biggest reason why I hate ransomware is because, I, I don't wanna say it's an overly simplistic problem, but it's basically a very, it's a very visceral manifestation of all of the things that computer security professionals have been saying for years is a problem in the industry. And management and organizations have chose to ignore a lot of the different security practices that we've been advocating for a very, very, very long time. I also feel in a lot of ways, um, it's, it's overly complicated and vendors are constantly trying to sell their solutions as the only solution to ransomware, which I think is a new variation of snake oil salesmen and women. Uh, that we are seeing in this industry. So let's go ahead and let's jump in. So I wanna talk a little bit about some of the recent attacks that we've been seeing because I think it shows us kind of a trend and an outline as far as where we're actually gonna end up going with ransomware. Unfortunately, when we're looking at Colonial and we're looking at the attack that actually happened, there's a bunch of things that that actually teaches us. But I think the dinner bell has been rung for attackers and they now understand that there is a tremendous amount of money that can be made uh, by going after certain parts of critical infrastructure. Uh, maybe not bringing things down to the point where people die, uh, but in the colonial example, they actually took down the management corporation side of the, uh, of the company, and that's enough to actually shut that company down. And what does that mean and how much would nation states be willing to pay and all of these different things? I think that that's important to get into. I'm gonna be covering deception. I, I don't, have my uh, Discord server up and running. It should be loading Discord here shortly. But I, I, I'm gonna hit deception because I don't believe that deception is the solution to this problem. But I think that deception is a solution to this problem. In, in short, it's, it, it's something that I think is becoming more and more key and foundational to actually trying to protect networks. And I came into this thing fast, live, and hot. I don't have Discord up and running. I'm not seeing the questions as they pop up like I normally do. Uh, I hate to do this to y'all, but just keep your questions till the end, and then we'll have uh, Jason basically relay some of those questions. So Jason, if you can kind of keep some questions that you think are super duper interesting, um, we'll, we'll just circle back at the end. So we might run a little bit long. Um, I'll get through the core part of the webcast, and then I'm just gonna stay on and do Ask Me Anything and log into Discord and hit the questions live. Um, as much as I can. I'm also gonna be hitting beacons. I got an email from Chris Brenton last night. Um, I, I love Chris Brenton like a brother, but the email that he sent me last night makes me want to throw things at walls, uh, kind of like Windows updates before webcasts. But it's, it's an incredibly frustrating observation that Chris Brenton came up with that I think highlights just how far we still have to come in this industry. And I think we're looking at dwell time, the amount of time it takes to actually detect an attack. We need to try to get that down and doing beaconing detection as part of it as well. I'm also gonna talk about a third type of ransomware. I think the overall industry is doing itself a disservice when we rush to judgment to try to define things as quickly as possible and then try to put trademark on it and be like, well, we were the first people to ever discover this or, one of my favorites of all time is two. I love the one where people are like, well, I invented object-oriented programming before it was a thing. That just basically says, you're a jackass and I don't want to party with you. And then the other thing that I hear all the time is people saying, well, we developed and coined the phrase APT. That was us. Who cares, right? Like, who cares? Like in this race to try to get to the point of defining something and saying, I was here first, we're losing some nuance. And this has happened a lot in the industry. And uh, all the way from cross-site scripting, all the way to what we're seeing with ransomware now, where people are, uh, are basically, no more attendees allowed, we hit the ceiling. Um, and apparently it insists on popping that up constantly, Jason. Unless I hit this magic little box, do not show again, there we go. So I wanna go through the third type of ransomware because we, we jumped too fast to try to define ransomware. I wanna talk about Racine uh, by Florian and how this is kind of showing us the way that we can actually deal with certain categories of ransomware and we can do it with open source and free tools and techniques. And honestly, it's some really novel, brilliant approaches. And then just some simple window settings that people can turn on in their environment to try to reduce the overall impact of other types of ransomware that exists. And I started with this uh, quote, explain to a child that we're mortal and that death is inescapable is probably for me 
the hardest part of being a party clown. That has nothing to do with this webcast whatsoever, but I'm gonna try to pop in some happy shiny things as we go through as much as possible. All right, so recent attacks. So we've all read in the news about the uh, pipeline attack and uh, with Colonial, and there's a bunch of, is this new? It's like Stuxnet. They're like, well, is this brand new? Is this a new cutting edge you know, concept of warfare? Is this a new like generation that we're in? No, it's basically an evolution that has now popped to the point where it's hitting the news, right? Um, so if you actually look at the attackers, the uh, dark side, um, if you actually look at what they're doing, it doesn't seem like they're new in the fact that they seem to be seasoned pros at what they're doing, and they're doing these tried and true methodologies of attacking and taking over a network. There's nothing here that stands out, and it's like, well, this is brand spanking new. We've never seen this before. This is completely novel. And I think that that's part of the frustration that I have with ransomware is I'm kind of a creature of novel and new things. Like um, if you're looking at speculative execution and sidechain attacks, I love those things. They're awesome to talk about because they're new, but their applicability to what we deal with in a day-to-day -day perspective, honestly, isn't there, right? It, it's not something that people have to worry about when they go into work on Monday and say, this is the first thing that we need to be dealing with right out of the gate. But it is interesting in the impact that it has on the United States, right? Like if you're talking 45% of gas pipeline to the East Coast, that's going to have an impact on prices, the pump. It's gonna have an impact on a wide variety of people's lives. And I think that that is getting to the point where it's novel and it's new. But the problem is in the security industry, we knew this day was coming. Like we knew that this was coming. We were talking about it all the way back with Blaster. You know, whenever we're 03026 um, is hitting systems and we had the Eastern Seaboard shut down, there were people in the industry that were standing up and saying, this security thing needs to be taken seriously. And, and oh, there's a lot of progress that was made in certain sectors, but it's not like as an industry, we progressed together. It was like some organization sprinted out ahead and did a really good job. And then a huge backlog of companies really did a crap job at actually securing their environments. And we're also seeing, and I'm gonna talk more about this here a little bit later, that you just can't look at your OT network segments, right? Um, I was pinging back and forth with Rob M. Lee from Dragos uh, last night. And one of the things I think is very difficult is when we're looking at a problem like OT or we're looking at SCADA ICS or we're looking at HIPAA, is there's this, this, this belief by some people that we're precious, wonderful, unique snowflake. And if we just segment it off, we're secure. And we're going to find out very quickly in this industry, the security industry, that that's garbage. Like you need to be looking holistically at your entire organization. You just can't say, that's where our secure stuff is, that's our PCI enclave. Because if somebody takes over the rest of the network, that shuts your business down, that shuts your organization down, that shuts down your, your quasi-governmental agency down as well. The next one that I really wanna talk about, we're gonna get into this some more, hackers threaten to release DC police data in apparent ransomware attack. This isn't new. Like we've seen attackers in the past do kind of an evolution of ransomware where they're like, we have something sensitive on your organization and we're gonna release it. And if you're looking at that particular scenario, if that happens, people are gonna die, right? Like if you release informant information uh, to the world and you have a bunch of criminal gangs and just criminals and they realize that there's this particular individual has been snitching on them, that's going to have tangible impacts on the heartbeat of that individual. If you're releasing data of where police officers are, right? And we can get into conversations about police reform and all these different things and Black Lives Matter and uh, you know what cops are doing, what they need to be doing. Do they need more training? Do we need to defund the police? I don't care right now as it relates to this conversation about those things. The fact is, if you actually start releasing information of police officers, there is real harm that can happen to them and their families. <laughs> and as much as people like to say crap, like, well, they deserve it. it. That's a load of garbage, guys. Like, we don't, nobody deserves to be killed. And I know that that can cut a number of different ways, but this is something that can have a tangible impact to the livelihood and lives of many people. 
and that represents something quote unquote new whenever we're looking at ransomware and how attackers can basically release and deal with this data as a whole. All right, so we're going to be discussing these things, right? We wanna get into them a little bit more. Come to the dark side. So it's amazing the customer support you get uh, from dark side and Reevil and these ransomware organizations, right? You go to their website, they have customer support, they'll walk you through everything, make sure that if you're having any issues paying them, um, they will walk you through how to pay those things. This is now, and it has been a business for a very long time. And it's a professional business. And that is something I think that is missed on the general population. That is something that is fundamentally missed by most security professionals Whenever you have them develop a mental model of a hacker, they try to put in this mental model of a hacker as somebody in a hoodie. They try to put this mental model of a hacker of some maladjusted youth in the basement of their parents' house, and they're hacking away at computer systems. And every single one of those personifications of hackers is demeaning to them. And I don't necessarily want to get into whether or not they deserve it or not, but by demeaning and dehumanizing the way that we look at hackers, we're actually mitigating and minimizing the overall threat that they present to us as a whole. You need to look at them as highly professional, highly trained, highly motivated. The finances are there to make this happen. They have protections in place. And if you're looking at this as a problem and you're saying, well, we're not going to get hit by these hackers because why would they want to do anything against our organization? You're just there. You exist. There's money that they can extract from you. Now, there's also conversations when we're looking at dark side about how they're applying their ethics, right? Like dark side has said, they're not going to hit hospitals. They're not going to hit places where people could die. They're not going to hit those things. And they're going to try to hit organizations that they feel can actually afford their ransomware. And that may be true, maybe, who knows? I, I don't know, but I will tell you from the history of hackers trying to have a moral fiber in what they're doing. Uh, Darkseid is donated to a number of different charities um, through Bitcoin and things like that. Is almost every single time that I can think of where you have a hacking group that makes money by breaking into places, and you couple that with like a charitable perspective, like a Robin Hood style approach, almost always that, that charitable notion is a very thin veneer of what they're doing. So I don't think that we should be looking at this and saying, well, these people are, are like Robin Hood hackers. They're stealing from the rich and they're giving to the poor. Um, because of the unintended consequences of what they would actually do if they cause harm. Like if you're looking at colonial going down, there's going to be consequences for that. And some of those consequences, no matter what your intentions, quote unquote, are, you're going to run into the likelihood of actually causing real harm to individuals further on down the line. But the point is, this is here to stay. I really liked it when hackers were just getting into networks and lo loading up crypto mining. And you know that's how they were making their money but if you're looking at crypto mining and how much money you can make off of it, the return on investment just isn't there uh, like it was a few years ago. But, oh, holy cow, we're now at the point where this ransomware thing pays off very, very well. So let's not try to romanticize them. Let's not try to over demonize them. Just understand that they're a thing. They exist. They're highly motivated. They're highly trained. They're professionals at what they do um, when you're setting up your mental model of what an attacker is. So let's get into deception. Um, let's hash this out. I, I deal with this all the time. I was actually talking to a friend of mine and, and they are like, ah, I'm not as much on the deception bandwagon as you are. Um, and I don't know why. So if you're looking at deception, it's almost like we've been hardwired in the industry to look at cyber deception as uh, when you do everything else, then do that. Uh, Brian Krebs has said this, Jeff Moss has said this, there's been a number of security professionals that have said this. I, I'm just going to flat out say it, they're wrong. Um, and if you disagree, fight me, let's go, let's have this out. If you're looking at deception, it's no longer a nice to have, it's no longer a neat thing. I'm going to say that deception is now something that should be part of the core of your security support structure. It is essential. It is absolutely essential. Don't look at this as, well, we should patch our systems, we should have EDR, we should have firewalls, we should have this, and then maybe we'll circle back around because it's a neat to have. No, 
if you're looking at a lot of these attacks, um, if you if you work with a lot of ransomware gigs, the ton of these organizations are running high-end EDR products, right? Like they're running Silence, they're running Carbon Black, they're running these tools, and the attackers are still bypassing those tools. Um, or they're not even using malware, they're using password spraying, gain access to the outside of the organization through a VPN, um, intercept two-factor authentication with evil jinx or something like that, gain access to the environment. The point is, we spent so much time and effort in trying to secure the endpoint and buying into the garbage in this industry that this endpoint is 100% effective that we started believing the hype and we started ignoring the fact that, oh, companies are still getting compromised even with these really expensive technologies in place. And I think it becomes far too easy for us to look at a hack that happens against an organization, be it a target, uh, be it uh, a colonial, and basically say, well, they're idiots. They suck at computer security because by kind of devaluing, dehumanizing them, it separates them out further from you. So you start to believe that that bad thing that can't that happened can't happen to you. So the point is, when you're looking at your security technologies, they're all going to fail. Then what? And a whole bunch of the deception marketplaces that exist today with many vendors are merely about honeypots. Like we just want to stand up a whole bunch of honeypots in your environment and then we'll detect the attacks. We need to go beyond that, right? Um, we need to be looking at the attack pathways that these attackers generally take post-exploitation to move laterally in an environment in an effort to take over that environment. Um, so what are the common active directory attacks that they do on a regular basis? Are they doing password spraying? Are they doing Kerber roasting? Probably still looking for group policy preference files, which has been an issue for a long time. They're gonna go after these common wins and they're going to use those because as a pen testing firm at Black Hills Information Security, we're still finding those constantly. And the attackers, if you go back to dark side, they're professionals. And if you look at the techniques that they're doing, they're doing tried and true techniques that any offensive adversary or offensive professional would actually go through. So what this opens up for you is the ability to put deception in the right places to detect when something has gone completely sideways in your organization. Because there's a fundamental difference between a workstation being compromised and an entire domain being compromised. A workstation being compromised and having a hard drive encrypted, whatever, that's a, that's a bad afternoon. Your entire organization being compromised from the top all the way to the bottom, that shuts your company down. That's going to get someone from your company going in front of Congress and having to explain what happened in the organization. So we wanna shut that particular type of attack path down to the attacks. So let's start with some basic ones, Word docs. You can do this, this isn't expensive. You know, Thinkist and, the, and, and Canary, they, they have an open source product that they've released that you can set up in your own environment. You can set up Word web bug servers. Um, Ethan has a tool that does Word web bug servers. This isn't hard, folks. This isn't one of those things where, my God, should we do data loss prevention and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars putting lots of hours into DLP, or should we do like honey docs? Do the honey docs. For the love of God, do the honey docs. It's an afternoon to set up in your environment, and it's going to work better than any DLP in your organization. I say this a lot, you know, I've never seen an offensive person say, well, gosh, their DLP got us. It just doesn't happen. And yet we spend lots of money on these things and it's important, right? Keeping honest people honest and trying to, you know, make sure that people aren't sending emails or social security numbers. I get that. But if you're trying to detect an attacker, the attackers, the attackers dance around DLP very easily in an organization. So we can set up word web bugs. We can put them on shares, compromise systems, websites, email them to spammers. When the attacker pivots, which they're going to do, give them something. Attackers are constantly looking through the shares, trying to find a document with the word password in it, Excel spreadsheets with passwords. You can set some bait in the right places that attackers are going to go and you can quickly identify when something's gone sideways in your organization. And this has a low false positive rate. So if somebody hits this document, it's either someone's snooping in shares they have no business snooping in or you have an attacker on your network that's trying to move around. 
this is an afternoon to set up and it's easy to do. And when it triggers, you can get an alert, you can get the IP address, you can even go so far if it's on the inside of your network, you can set up in packet with an SMB server where you can capture the name, the password hash, the machine name of the system that's compromised. This is something you can do and you can do easily. You need to set this stuff up. And yeah, I've got a pay what you can class on cyber deception. And everything that we walk through walks through how to set up cyber deception in a location where an attacker that does offensive operations for a living, be them evil or be them good, are going to go through. It's simple to set up. And you get some attribution out of it too. That's cool. So this is at the last DerbyCon. This is something right out of my class where I got attribution and said, well, Brian Strand opened this document somewhere in Louisville, Kentucky. And we were about five, six miles off from where we're at. But even with something like this, if I get the IP address of an attacker, I can trace route to that IP address, take the last route before that IP address, which is one of the routers, before it jumps into uh, the edge router for the customer or the attacker or the victim or whoever, I can trace route, take the second to last routing hop, and it gets you within a block of where the attacker is. Why? Because your ISPs are tracking their assets, and they're very much tracking the latitude and longitude of where their assets are for their routing infrastructure. But does this necessarily stop ransomware? I don't know. A lot of these attackers are in places like Eastern Europe, or they're in Russia, or they're in countries that have really poor extradition. So I don't think you're going to be in a situation where you're going to be able to put somebody on a plane and go arrest this person. But from a detective capability, from a detective capability, let's walk through the attack. The attacker pops a box. They try to pivot by finding docs with passwords in them, which they do. Trust me, they do. Worked IR gigs, they do. We do pen tests all the time. We do this. It's table stakes. If you're an offensive person working at DarkSide and you've taken over a network and you haven't pivoted around and found documents with passwords, I guarantee you, your management is going to have words with you. At DarkSide, they actually go through the network, they identify funds, they identify money, they identify how much money the organization they have, they identify the management. They're doing pivoting, folks, and they're doing the exact same pivoting that we do at BHIS and TrustedSec does and Secure Ideas does and Guardians does. You're seeing the exact same techniques play out. So now an attacker breaks into a system, pivots, tries to find a doc, opens the doc, you get an alert, you shut them down, congratulations, your company doesn't end up in the news. Everyone likes that. We, <laughs> this isn't hard. I'm not saying it's an end-all, be-all, folks. I'm not saying we've solved ransomware with honey dogs, but I'm saying that this can be something that's in your arsenal of securing your environment. You can do this. This isn't hard. Another one, honey accounts. Oh, dear God, do honey accounts right now. Like after you're done with this webcast, sit down with your security team and your change management team and say, we want to set up some honey accounts in Active Directory. You can name them names like Adam, ADM, Administrator. You can name them Bill. You can name them Bob. Just make sure that they're a valid account. Log into that account so it updates the login time from January 1st, 1601 to a real login time. Set the password to something stupid, ridiculously long, and then disable the logon hours for that account. So it's an active account that's been effectively disabled. And wait. Once again, table stakes. If you're an offensive professional at VHIS and you're pivoting and I go through the report and you didn't try to do a password spray low and slow, I'm going to have questions for you. Like, why didn't you do that? Because this works. Once again, ransomware attacks. Seeing two companies last year, that's what the attackers did was a password spray on the inside of the environment. If they would have had honey accounts up and running, they would have detected it. Also. You can set up a password spray. If you're a malicious attacker, you've got time, lots of time. You're gonna be patient. You're gonna fly underneath the UEBA, user and entity behavioral analytics. You're gonna do passwords once every five seconds. You're gonna do one password. You're gonna spread it over days to make sure that you're flying under that radar. This will still detect it. 
because they're going to get access to a workstation, run net user space forward slash domain, dump all of the user accounts off of that computer system. Then they're going to try a password very, very slowly, something like spring 2021 against every single one of those use those user accounts running low and slow to fly under the sim and the UEBA. But as soon as they hit your honey account, you should have a rule set up that go so far as to say, this rule is set up. If anyone tries to access this account, we immediately shut that workstation down on the environment. Isolate it. Lock the account out that's logged into that. Just set, set up smoke signals. Have the IR team go and work at this workstation. You can do this. This takes, like, seriously, this takes you five to 10 minutes to do. And in our SOC that we're setting up at BHIS, this is core, right? Like, this is core because there's a large number of attacks that the single best way to detect the attack is setting up multiple different points of deception in the environment to detect it. Because we're going into it with the core assumption that your endpoint security is going to fail. Your firewall is going to fail. Knowing that those things are going to fail, what catches you at that point? This is easy to do, folks. It's not expensive. You can set it up in a matter of an afternoon. You're just dealing with the politics of it, which I get from the political perspective is something that you have to take into account. So if an attacker runs something like a domain password spray using a password of winter 2020, goes through, hits a bunch of user accounts, they're going to try to log in to the Honey accounts in your domain. And as soon as they do, they don't have to actively log into that account at all. They just have to try. And as soon as they try to authenticate to that account, you've got them. You got them dead to rights. Curb roasting. We're going to revitalize one of our projects, uh, the Cred Defense Toolkit, where you can actually create Kerber roasting cyber deception, where if somebody tries to run a Kerber roasting attack, you can detect and you can react to it. Why? Because all of the adversaries that are out there, offensive, good guys, and bad folks, every single one of them is going to try to do a Kerber roasting attack on the inside of the environment to move laterally and pivot and escalate the environment. I guarantee it. So why aren't we detecting this? We need to be detecting this, and you can do it with cyber deception. You can do it. So like I said, this is necessary. So if we're, if we're fighting about this, right? Like if people are like, well, I don't know, we should do other things. Like setting up a honey account, 10 minutes. Setting up a document on the inside of an environment for pivoting or detecting someone in your environment, all it takes is running canary tokens on your environment that's going to take you maybe an hour or hell. You can even set it up on canary tokens web server throw that document out on a share, call it passwords.doc, and just wait. The attackers will search for the word password across all of your files in your environment. You'll be able to detect them, right? So we can do this, right? So we have that ability. It is not hard. It is not expensive. So why would you fight me on this? I feel like I've been saying this for like eight to 10 years now, and it, it kind of catches on every once in a while, but then you have people to say, well, you should do a bunch of other stuff like DLP first. Okay, it's going to fail. It's not going to stop these attackers. This is the stuff that's going to help you set that early warning tripwire to detect the attackers earlier in your environment. And it's easy, and it's inexpensive. Hell, it's free. So let's do this, all right? The next one, applicability. Attacker pops a box. They try to pivot by password spraying or curb roasting. You detect it immediately. You shut them down. Your CEO, CEO does not throw you under the bus before Congress. It was a good day. It's easy to do. You got to come up with a hell of an argument to tell me why not to do these things in place. Some people will be like, well, the attacker might not hit it. Trust me, if you set your cyber deception in the right places, looking at the attack path, or God help me, the cyber kill chain that these attackers are running through, you will detect them. Go to CISA, go to the write-ups that are inevitably going to come up for this attack, go to the write-ups for previous attacks and against taking over an entire domain, and you're going to see the exact same freaking steps being used again and again and again. Look at any pen testing report that you can get your hands on that is an internal pivot or a red team with a pivot, and you're going to see the exact same freaking techniques. You can set up deception on those techniques for free. You can set it up this week, and you can be in a much better situation to detect ransomware style attacks in your environment.
We don't do it because you read books, you read best practices. They're not telling you to do it. You have vendors that charge hundreds of thousands of dollars to do these things. So we tend to step away and try to focus on the same tired things and the same base things that the attackers are bypassing regularly in the industry. We can do better. Network analysis. You, you, you know, you can't go to a webcast with me without me talking about Rita. Um, I'm sorry. And, and there's a number of reasons why. I, I feel like I'm in that uh, far side cartoon where I'm standing in the middle of the street and saying, vampires, vampires, everywhere, vampires. And there's two people holding a mirror and literally everyone around this individual is a vampire and doesn't show up in that mirror. Um, we, we can detect command and control, folks. Now, it doesn't mean you're not going to get hacked, right? You're going to get that initial compromise. But for most of the organizations that we have HTOC services and we set up SOC services and we run Rita on, we can actually detect that backdoor being activated one hour at least into that. And the only reason why it's not faster is that's how Zeek rolls its logs that we pick up in ingest. We can detect that. Now, you're still popped. A lot can happen in an hour. But good God. Don't give them days in your organization to learn your management hierarchy structure. Don't give them days to search for documents of sensitive things in your organization. I, I mean, it takes, it takes time to pivot around an environment, not just to take over DA, but it takes time to be in that environment to learn. And if you're looking at dark side, and if you want to give them mass respect for one thing, they're patient. They learn about their target organizations. They learn management hierarchy. They pivot and they move laterally like a pro team. And they're not a bunch of chumps that are just popping boxes and locking systems down quickly. No, they're actually doing a pretty fantastic job of learning about an organization, learning the hierarchy of the organization, learning how to hurt them how much they can hurt them, and specifically who they can talk to that can make a difference. It's funny, in security, we always talk about signing authority. Do you have signing authority? Dark side is freaking finding the person that has signing authority, and they're talking to that person directly. That's a lot of time in your network. And your network analysis can help you detect that. And yes, we have released a tool for free that you can set up. Go to activecountermeasures.com forward slash free tools, Rita. Download it and get it up. Run it on a span port. Um, and then start looking for those systems that have high beacon scores. Um, yeah, you're going to have to go through. You're going to have to do some whitelisting or allow listing. You're going to have to do some baselining of your network traffic. But seriously, there's tons of customers that we've had in Europe and in the United States that are like, holy crap, that's literally the only thing in our network that caught domain fronting. That's literally the only thing in our network that caught solar winds once it got activated. Not the initial beacon, because that's like one packet. But once it was activated with the Cobalt Strike C2, where it was at 20% jitter, I think, running over HTTP, yeah, Rita can detect it, folks. It absolutely can. It's all about reducing that dwell time. So let's talk about Chris Brenton ruining my evening. So Chris sent me this email. He said, hey, dude, uh, one data point you might want to convey tomorrow is that ransomware is skewing the dwell time numbers between initial compromise and detection. If you go to a lot of cons and presentations, there's a whole bunch of back padding where they're basically saying, hey, the dwell time for attackers is going down. It, 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 it used to be months. Now it's getting down on average to a few weeks. Congratulations, security community, we rock. He said, the sites that are reporting that we are getting better than six months of detection are including ransomware in their calculations. In my honest opinion, that shouldn't count as it's the attacker revealing themselves, not an actual detection. Let that sink in. Attacker breaks into your environment, stays there for a couple of days, comes out and says, hey, I'm in your network, I've taken over everything. That's showing up as a detection within a couple of days because the attacker decided to notify you that they are in your network. In my honest opinion, in my honest opinion that shouldn't count as the attacker revealing themselves not as an actual detection. When you separate ransomware and APT, we are still at a six month dwell time for most APT. I was on this train, honestly. I was saying, hey, things are getting better. Look at the numbers. Look at the dwell time. This is awesome. Congratulations, security team. But we can do better yet. But he's right. You remove ransomware from the calculations, and all of a sudden, that dwell time number is starting to skew 
back up to where it was before. And that scares me, right? Because that's all about that dwell time. We can't have our attackers dwelling for long periods of time. And we released a tool for free that helps reduce that dwell time as much as we possibly can, not based on signatures. So that's, that's Chris ruining my evening. So good news, everyone. There is no good news. So yeah, I'm sorry this is kind of a bitter webcast. I know it's usually more fun, but sit tight. It's going to get worse. Um, so ransomware of a third kind. I'm going to go get some coffee. All right, so ransomware of a third kind. Traditionally, whenever you see people defining ransomware, they define ransomware in two categories. Uh, they define ransomware in category one as being ransomware that encrypts your hard drive, right? Um, so it's going to encrypt your hard drive. And then ransomware category two is the ransomware that encrypts your files. And I'm going to show you ways that we can deal and block a lot of category one and two. You don't see a lot of people talking about category three. And category three is ransomware where they break into an organization, they steal a crap ton of files from that organization, and then they threaten to release those files publicly. If you look at Reevil, if you look at um, DarkSide, they actually have on their websites, they have a whole list of organizations that they've compromised, and then links where you can download the data that they stole from that organization. Uh, by and large, they do that. They do data dumps for a couple of reasons. One, as proof of life, that they have that data. I think one of the law firms that was popped a little while ago, they released a bunch of court documents from Lady Gaga just to prove that they had that. And a lot of these organizations, these hacker or attacker organizations, they will take those files if you don't pay, and then they just do a full dump online somewhere. Now, traditionally, a lot of the news sites that are out there are very reticent to actually go through and do analysis of those files and sharing the information and writing stories about the victims. So that's good, but it's still out there. It's still out there, right? So you still have that problem um, as a whole. Um, you got healthcare data, of course, is, is showing up more and more and more. And that's having impacts on people's lives. A law firm, one of the law firms that, uh, um, uh, that's just one, there's like three or four uh, that have been popped. Attackers love law firms because you get that law firm, you get access to patents, you get access to sensitive documentation that could impact uh, organizations, people, the rich and the famous. Panama Papers are probably one of the biggest, uh, like best examples of that. So you have this kind of third style of attack. And the problem is, it really is difficult to detect because an attacker may move into the organization with valid user IDs and passwords and then steal those files. And it doesn't take a lot to actually create reputational harm to that organization, right? So when we're thinking of ransomware, let's not allow the traditional definition of encrypting your hard drive because now you're seeing attackers that aren't even doing that. They're basically just stealing the files and threatening to release them. And the reason why. I think this means something. The reason why I think that this is important is because there are technical measures that are starting to come out that'll deal with the first two. Like Microsoft has a setting we'll talk about briefly where you can actually watch certain folders and look for encryption uh, activity or more accurately, uh, non-authorized application activity. We can do things like Racine uh, from Florian where we can uh, watch for VSS admin uh, delete shadows and stop that process and kill the parent process that invoked it. So there's the beginnings of some things to stop that type of ransomware. But this type of ransomware is going to be here to stay for a while. Um, it's going to be here to stay for a while, no question. So I did have a quick note, and this is going to piss some people off, um, but I'm going to go headlong into it. Um, at BHIS, we actually are cross-sectional across a lot of market verticals. I mean, that's kind of the nature of a pen testing firm. Um, if you look at any pen testing firm out there, they're they're testing, you know, they're they're testing SCADA, ICS, OT. They're they're testing um, healthcare. They're testing credit card companies. They're testing all over the place. And whenever you talk to people that deal with like the power grid, critical infrastructure, you'll see these quotes, right, where they say the power grid is a special security case. We need segmentation to keep these legacy systems running for years. We have, we have systems and we have devices that you can't replace. 
um, they just need to run. And you just can't go out and buy new ones. They just have to run for sometimes decades. And if we don't do this correctly, people can die. Okay. All right. Another quick note. Medical is a special security case. We need segmentation and we need to keep legacy systems running for years. We have, we have MRI systems, we have dialysis machines, we have all of this medical equipment and we plan on it being in existence for at least 10 years. And some of them don't even have internet ports. And if we don't do this correctly, people can die. Okay. The financial sector, talk to banks. You go to, you go to banks, you'd be surprised how many banks, if you go to the core of what's running that bank, it's a freaking AS400 from decades ago. Like it's, it's, not, it's not an exception, right? It's like the rule, right? So you, you, know, you have all of these legacy, legacy mainframe systems at the heart of the financial sector, and you have people in the financial sector say, financial is a special security case. We need segmentation and keep legacy systems running for years. If we don't do this correctly, people will die. Now, I want you to understand that in finance, like if people are like, well, banks hack, do people die? Hell yes. If you actually look at like Greece where they actually shut down people accessing banks and being able to get their freaking money, people go from, oh, I can't get money from an ATM to burning things in the streets and riot gear in about 24 hours. So if you look at a very, very large bank, and there's many of those banks, if they go down to the point where people can't get their money, they can't get their loans, they can't pay for their mortgage, you watch how quickly people start rioting and panicking and start burning down the front entryways of some of these banks. They take this seriously. And at their heart, there's a whole bunch of technology that's ancient. Another note. Defense is a special security case. We need segmentation to keep legacy systems running for years. If we don't do this correctly, people could die. Defense is where I've cut my teeth. That's where I came up. And there are still Solaris Spark systems, Spark 8 and 9 systems, and older systems that are running 20 to 50 million lines of code and the people that wrote those systems have either retired or died or basically moved on to the lands to the east and they don't update their freaking systems because they can't it's not an issue of just rewriting these things although it kind of is but they just choose not to do it because it's freaking expensive to do so so Here's my point on this. Every one of them are cracked. You look at SCADA, ICS, OT, you look at defense, you look at finance, you look at healthcare, every single one of them, they're absolutely correct. They're absolutely a special case. They absolutely have legacy software and they have legacy hardware that they just cannot get rid of because it's literally running stuff that, you know, if it goes down, people could die, we could lose power, dogs and cats living together raining frogs and all of these different things. They're all right. And they're all saying the same things. And they all think that they're completely unique in the fact that they have legacy applications in their environments and they can't secure them for whatever reason. So what this does to all of us is there's some things that happen in many organizations, not all, okay? One of the things that happens in organizations is they use that excuse as a crutch. They basically say, well, we're just going to focus on securing the OT network. And then we'll air gap it, which it's never air gapped. Like I've worked on some of the most like secure classified networks in the world that were air gapped. Totally weren't, we came to find out. So you, anytime anyone's talking about what we do, air gapping and certain segmentation, there's always, always a bridge between the two. And the attackers are going to find those things. And they're absolutely going to find those things given enough time. So everybody in almost every market, actually every single market vertical, has the same type of problem set. But how we choose to deal with that problem set is really the crux of the issue that we're running into. Where companies say, John, I want you to come in with BHIS, and we want you just to test the PCI enclave. 
That's the only thing we care about here because that's the only thing we have to actually secure and have tested regularly. So just lock that down and make sure that that's locked down. We want to focus there. Or they'll say, you don't have to worry about that, John, because it's segmented. It's segmented off and we've got exceptions and our auditors are cool with it. You know, uh, you know, you know we're, we're fine. And you don't understand. It's a special network. Like it's, it's, it's running, you know, trains, planes, and automobiles. And yeah, you know, you wouldn't understand at all. So we, we just, just, just don't touch it. It's okay. We can't do anything with it. And what happens is this becomes a crutch for some organizations. And worse, compliance frameworks support this freaking crutch. I mean, hell, we still have PCI talking about ridiculously short passwords. Why? Because of legacy systems. And if you go through a lot of these, they have all these exceptions and they say, well, we can't fix that AS400 system uh, because it's core to the bank and we can't update it. And, uh, you know, pff, well, oh, it's just, it just kind of sucks. Sorry. So what happens, and I think Colonial is a great example of that. Yeah, you may just focus on that enclave. You may just focus on that thing. But if the rest of your business or the rest of your operation goes down, you're going down. You're absolutely going down. You cannot ignore the rest of your infrastructure just for that infrastructure. You can't ignore your protected enclave infrastructure, be it finance or healthcare or OT or whatever it is. You can't just ignore those things because they're quote unquote segmented because they rarely are. Best people in this industry understand that this stuff is all interconnected. The outside of these protected enclaves is connected to the inside of these enclaves. And yeah, you get hacked out there and it will absolutely shut down your ability to actually process. The other thing is I know, and I'm preaching to the choir predominantly to a lot of you, I get that. Um, and I know I probably ruffled some feathers and I'm gonna have emails and people disagreeing with me, but you're wrong. I mean, all of these organizations say the exact same crap. They all do. And they're all trying to get the exact same special dispensations and the exact same exceptions. So the problem is we in, in DOD and in OT and in finance and in healthcare and in all of these different verticals, people say we aren't going to upgrade that system because we just can't upgrade that system. There's a powerful question. When? Don't allow the conversation about upgrading your infrastructure end with just saying we're not doing anything there has to be a when and that when can be something as simple as we're going to start a five-year plan to start upgrading the when can be we are going to upgrade once um a vendor comes out with a product that's an upgrade to this particular thing it, there has to be a when there has to be because if you're looking at our technologies whether it's ot pci whether it's any of these different things you can't run the rest of eternity on a Solaris Spark system. You can't run the rest of eternity on an AS400 system that you can't buy hard drives for anymore. So you need to get into the habit in the security realm of asking the question when, what conditions have to be met? What levers can we pull to help meet these conditions? We need that. Because when you start having that question of when, then you as a company, as a customer to these technologies, now I have the ability to create a market for these different upgraded technologies to come into an existence. If you want something horrifying, um, just for some light reading, if you're looking in the OT space, you're looking in the power grid, I want you to Google legislative capture. Because there's a lot of people in the power grid, they're like, why aren't we upgrading things in the power grid? Like, why aren't we uh, upgrading things to smart meters and doing you know, technology like solar panels? Why aren't we investing in that? Why aren't we investing more in security for all these little devices that are all over the place? Do me a favor and look up legislative capture and understand how co power companies make money. There are certain activities that power companies by many states' rights are the only way that they can make money are by doing certain large-scale infrastructure activities that they can make profits on those activities where the other things that are related to computer security may not fall into that category. So they're not going to put any money into that category because there's no profit to be made in that category and it directly becomes a cost center. This is bad. And many people don't understand just how bad it actually is. 
but Google legislative capture and power companies and look at how power companies are allowed to make money. And you'll start to understand why there isn't a market in, for investment and in infrastructure upgrades for certain components, because it's not something that they can pass the costs on to their constituents or the, uh, the people that they serve. So yeah, everybody's correct, but we need to start pushing back as an industry. And the problem is a lot of these compliance standards are written for one market vertical. And that market vertical believes that they're the only market vertical that has the problem of legacy technologies. We need to find a way that we can start addressing this cross-sectional across the entire industry so it's no longer acceptable for us to have technologies that are 15, 20 years old in our environment. We have to do better. And that's okay. You know, like I said, this, this presentation is a bit dark and I apologize for that uh, profusely. I really do. But hey, look, if we in this industry don't get it, that's okay. If, if you have managers in HIPAA and SCADA and OT and all these different things, and they refuse to do the things that we're talking about here and investing in infrastructure, changing the compliance standards, changing the way legislative capture works so that power companies can make money on these incremental improvements in their infrastructure, that's okay. It's all right. Because these folks, these nameless folks that rollerblade, they're going to teach us the error of our ways. They're going to. They're gonna show us, like as much as I talk to companies, and I've talked to a number of companies that say, we're not gonna worry about that security issue because it's not part of the enclave that we watch, or the other way, where they're gonna be like, we're not gonna worry about this issue because we're segmented. That's fine. Because the hackers out there, they're gonna teach us the error of our ways in this industry. Because they don't give a rat's ass about your compliance document. They honestly do not care at all whatsoever about what exceptions you have to your policies. They're very much targeted. They're very much professional. They're very well trained. They have excellent customer support and the money is there and they're coming for it. That's okay. They're gonna teach us the error ways. That doesn't scare me. This particular slide doesn't scare me at all because this is the way it's been working for years. The hackers have been teaching us the error of our ways and the way that we're securing our environments. What scares me is this one. These folks will fix the error of our ways. These are the people, if we can't figure out a way to successfully start communicating the risks associated with ransomware, the risks associated with like ignoring the proper security controls that we need to have in place in an organization, these are the people that are gonna help you and me. These are the people that are gonna come up with the policies, they're gonna come up with the laws, the regulatory compliance frameworks, they're going to come up with the ways that we're going to fix our networks. Be afraid. Be very, very afraid. So let's think. So let's think about how ransomware works. And I'm going to talk specifically about two types. Um, and the Canary Tokens works great for the third type um, whenever you're dealing with documents that are actually stolen. Um, but let's, let's think about how ransomware works in the two main categories. Because I really wanted to leave you with a couple of quick technical things that you can use in your organization that'll actually help reduce the overall risk of in particular automated ransomware that may hit your organization. So the first one I wanted to show you, I didn't have time to actually get it set up because my system was installing uh, updates, but let's just do it. So I'm just gonna install Racine on my system and I'm gonna show you how it works. Let's go ahead and let's download the code. Let's download that zip file. I'm going to open up a terminal. Right click, run it as administrator. Accept that. There we go. Um, so now we've got Racine. Um, I'm going to take this and I'm going to copy it. I'm going to go to my tools folder. I don't have a tools folder. We're going to create a tools folder. There we go. And we are going to paste Racine in there. There we go. Got it. All right. So now um, I'm going to go into that directory. And I'm going to copy uh, cmd.exe to this directory. And I'm going to rename it.
I'll just put it into tools, Racine, okay? And I'm gonna call it totes, totes.exe. All right, so I've just copied uh, cmd.exe and I've named it totes. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna install uh, Racine on the system and I'm gonna show you kind of how it works. So one of the things that attackers love to do is they like to delete volume shadow copies, okay? And the reason why they delete volume shadow copies is if they lock down your hard drive and they put on encryption, if you can restore back to a previous version of Windows that doesn't have that encryption, then you can restore your system. So you always have that, if you have your system reboots a number of times, um, it pops up and it says, would you like to restore from a known good copy of Windows? That's a volume shadow copy. Um, it's kind of like a little restore, hidden restore partition that's on your Windows computer system. And the attackers delete that, okay? So what we're going to do is we're gonna show you how Florian um, basically wrote a tool that hooks that process and it watches if anybody runs it with delete um, and a whole bunch of different variations. So I'm gonna set up rest scene so it's running on the system. Oh, great. Maybe uh, maybe it didn't work. Maybe this whole entire demo is going to go down in flames. Awesome. That's that's just great. All right. Well, let's give it a shot. What the hell? YOLO. Um, so now I'm going to run totes as administrator. And uh, once again, my whole demo, of course, I'm demoing, so it's going to die. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to run VSS admin, and we're going to do delete shadows. I don't know why all of a sudden it's not working. Crap. Well, that's what you get whenever you come into stuff. But this is what it looks like. Let's go to their helpful page. So what Racine does in a demo that clearly didn't work for me at all um, is whenever you try to run the VSS admin delete shadows command right here, um, it picks up on that. And then it stops it from occurring so the volume shadow copies don't get deleted. And then what it does is it kills the executable that invoked it as well. So if you give me a minute, I'll uh, at the end, I'm going to go through and try to figure out what happened while I'm answering questions. I'll stop sharing my screen. I think Racine didn't install properly, but we'll, we'll come back to it. But that's important because if an attacker is trying to delete those shadows, which almost never happens, like if you look at, you know, how many, you're always creating new volume shadow copies constantly, going through and deleting them only happens when people are trying to free up hard drive space on their computer system. So seriously, this works out really, really well for stopping that class of ransomware. Of course, not for me today because the demo gods are after me, uh, which is fine. That's they get, demo gods got to do what demo gods got to do, y'all. Um, so that's resting. And like I said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and start answering questions here in just a little bit, and then I'll, I'll just fix it while we're answering questions. So file and folder protection. So Microsoft realized with file and folder encryption ransomware that they can put in a protection that says, hey, what programs actually need to access these folders? Like, you know, Excel and Access and uh, Word and Explorer. Like, these are the things that need to access these folders. And if all of a sudden a new program shows up and it starts trying to access the files or trying to encrypt the files, we can actually shut that down. And this is built into Windows systems. Now, Windows doesn't turn it on by default, and they don't because they're afraid of the impact it will have for third-party applications that may be accessing those files and folders. But you can actually test it and run it in your environment, and it'll generate alerts for you. Also, Racine generates alerts. Um, they go into the application event logs. There's actually alerts that are generated from Racine where it stops these. And I'll show you that if I can get this thing working um, here in the next couple of seconds. I might try to bring up one of my VMs and do it that way. So yeah, there's two things out of the box that you can do relatively easily. And speaking of Florian, um, he posted this today on Twitter, and I thought it really, really kind of summed up where we're at with how we deal with ransomware, where companies are freaking out whenever you have something like um, like Darkside, and they're like, what are the inter what are the indicators of compromise for that? And they ignore like generic hardening rules and the different things that we can do that we should be doing, the, the good hygiene, like backups. Like seriously, have backups. That, that works. Of course, 
we've also seen Reevil and 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 the fine folks at Darkside will actually stay on your network for an extended period of time, and they'll find a way to get get around your your backup strategy. But um, it is something that we should be doing. But that's not sexy, and that's not cool. The the thing that this particular this particular like cartoon from Florian really kind of drives home for me is the fact that we're still doing threat intelligence wrong. And you're like, oh God, he's going to do Rita and threat intelligence. Darn right I am. If you're looking at threat intelligence, we're constantly trying to find the IOCs for the attack that hit Colonial. We want to stop that, right? But what people don't understand is the techniques that Darkseid used are very much tailored to that attack. And being tailored to that attack does not mean that they're going to use the exact same damn techniques against you. If you look at their malware that they're using, they aren't using any like cutting edge, amazing malware. They're using the stuff that works with some obfuscation built into it to bypass certain security technologies. So the malware that the attackers use in one attack is not going to be the same malware that they're going to use against your network or other networks. So a lot of those IOCs for that type of malware for a targeted attacker, it's not going to work for you. And plus, your antivirus already has those signatures. At least it should already have those signatures. If you're looking at the IP addresses or the domains that they're using, they're not using them anymore. They aren't. They've moved on to other things. So when we're looking at the IOCs, it's kind of like the IOCs that every red team is using all of the time. And that feeds into that second table, hardening, 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 using generic rules to detect things like net user space forward slash domain using techniques like detecting somebody runs VSS admin from the command prompt on a computer system. We can do this, folks, but we've got to stop being blinded by the bright, shiny objects and try to move as quickly as we can to start detecting some of the straight down the fairway things that we haven't been able to detect yet because we're constantly sidetracked by what vendors are telling us. So I wanted to say thanks. And like I said, I, I knew this presentation uh, when I got up and I started writing it. I knew this presentation presentation was going to be a little bit dark, um, but I wanted to give you a bunny, um, and I hope it makes up for kind of maybe being a little bit darker than normal at this presentation and for the government slide earlier, because I know that there's a bunch of you that are like, I really don't like this. It makes me feel bad. So thanks again for hanging out. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to have Jason read me some questions, and I'm going to figure out what the hell is going on. Um, with Racine. So, um, so let's bring in some questions, folks. This is the part where I find out that I've been on this presentation for like an hour and no one's heard anything at all of what I said. So uh, Jason isn't here and uh, I'm going to be your stand-in today for questions, John. Awesome. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, so there are a bunch of questions. I, gra I grabbed some of these here. Um, uh, there was a lot of questions about um, kind of setting up Honey accounts. I, I think a couple of them were about the detection of the Honey accounts. Like, you know, if you set up a Honey account, oh, well, they'll detect the Honey account. Uh, one of them. Yeah, was, absolutely, 100% correct. You know, yeah, assuming, go ahead. Assuming we're all, vo or, uh, what, no, that's not the right question. I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, the uh, the the general gist was that honey accounts get could get detected. What would you do to make sure that they don't get detected? There was a couple questions like that. Sorry, I kind of have cool. them out of order. All right, so here's the deal. You kind of want them to get detected. Um, it, it's kind of like a bear trap in a very dark room. Um, it, it's kind of the equivalent of saying, well, if an attacker breaks into my house and they start walking around, they might actually step into my bear trap and discover that there's a bear trap. That's the very nature of what we want the deception technologies to do. Um, so if we're talking word web bugs, yeah, if they open it up, they fire it, they're going to see a connection coming out of it. They know that something happened. Um, so that's important. When you're talking about the accounts, what you can do to reduce the likelihood of detection of those accounts is first and foremost, you want to go through and you want to actually log into that account. That's number one. Um, you want to log into that account because if you don't log into the account, a blank access time on an account is January 1st, 1601, I think, for Active Directory. It's either that or January 1st, 1970. And attackers um, are very, very good 
at sort of sidestepping those accounts that have never ever been logged into, all right? So that's step one. You wanna actually log into that account and set it up so it actually has a login date. Number two, you don't wanna disable the account. Almost any of the tools that are out there that are designed for um, like doing password sprays, they are specifically designed for avoiding disabled accounts. So the account needs to be enabled, needs to have been logged in at some point, and then you need to make sure that the login hours are zero and the password is really long. But here's the kick in the teeth on all this. The attacker is not going to do it that way. Like they, they, the attacker, so when people are looking at these types of attacks, they look at it like the attacker is going to look for these accounts and go after them. And that's not how attackers do that. Like we don't go, well, here's five administrator accounts. Oopsies, <laughs> one might be a honey account. What we do, God, you guys, look at this. I'm resetting my VM, trying to figure out why Racine's not working. <laughs> Windows, get my damn update. This again. Oh, seven, this this again. Not stop. This is just my day. Oh, my God. Um, Bill's got it out for you. Yeah, so that's not how attackers do it, okay? The way attackers do it is we dump every single user from the entire domain and we password spray every freaking user. We don't go through and start looking at, well, I'm going after that account or that account or those <laughs> accounts. It's just every single one of them. Um, the only it, difference that you get is the tuning and the speed and how slow we actually go. So go ahead, Ralph. Yeah, I was just, I was gonna say, I was thinking of that question too. And, and when I do an engagement and I look at accounts and stuff, I usually look for accounts that haven't had a password reset in a long time. So if you can uh, change that metadata or, you know, change that to like password reset back in 1998 or something or whatever it makes sense, uh, that's going to be a very <laughs> intriguing account for me because I assume that the password's probably horrible. So, Yeah, exactly. And you do see that all the time whenever you're breaking into organizations post-exploitation where they set up accounts that the password is never set to expire. And the worst offenders for that are freaking domain admins, right? They get in yeah. and they don't have to have the rules apply to them. So they just have it so the rules don't apply to them. So, all right, what other questions do we have? Yeah, sure. Um, what is the trigger events that force a ground up examination or sterilization of the code, right? So the IOC um, mm -hmm. and does not have to be public sector attention, money regulation to enforce that. So what would what would cause Are you there John? I think we lost your audio. Oh no, his internet went out, didn't it? Yeah, I'm that's what I'm thinking too. We, <laughs> this might have ended very short here. <laughs> was he on a, a different computer or did it just reboot on him and he lost his connection? No, that was a VM that was uh, rebooting there. So uh, I have no idea what just happened. I think we might have lost him. Yeah. I think it was, I think we're, we're a little bit past the scheduled end time anyway, though, right? So I think we're. All right, time. Yeah, no, I mean, we're, we were just answering questions at this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. It's a shame, but I think we covered most of what he wanted to cover. Yeah, so I guess um, we'll end this here. I mean, uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. We lost John. I think Bill Gates went and rebooted his computer or he lost his internet. Um, really appreciate everybody showing up for this uh, webcast hopefully we can maybe he'll come back here um we might wait around for a minute but I, I have no idea right now uh where he's at so um yeah left out in the ocean by myself <laughs> i think we can probably safely shut it down here yeah yeah, no, I think I think you're right, BB. So uh, again, everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, sorry, this got stopped short. Uh, John lost uh, internet, it seems like at this point. So, but again, thanks everyone for coming. And uh, I guess we'll go ahead and uh, close down the webcast and uh, really hope you guys appreciate um, everything that was uh, talked about today about ransomware. And uh, you guys all got some uh, opportunity to learn some things today. So uh, I appreciate it, guys.